Before we discuss classical or structuralist organizational theories, I'd like to take a minute to define organizations, management, and leadership. According to Argyris and Schoen, organizations are comprised of individuals who define its membership and establish rule-governed ways of making decisions to take collective action. According to Rost, management is an authority relationship between at least one manager and one subordinate who coordinate their activities to produce and sell particular goods and services. Ross defines leadership as an influence relationship among leaders and followers who intend real changes that reflect their mutual purposes. As we noted previously, the structural frame draws upon the field of sociology and emphasizes the importance of formal roles and relationships. Organizational charts are created to depict formal relationships and official communication patterns used to coordinate activities. Managers allocate responsibilities to participants, in other words, a division of labor, create rules, regulations, and policies to handle routine work, and managers make decisions when exceptions arise. When the structure does not fit the situation, then managers are required to reorganize or restructure the organization. The structural frame focuses on the needs of the organization and emphasizes efficiency. People are viewed as serving the needs of the organization. According to Bowman and Deal, people are viewed pragmatically as serving the needs of the organization. What I'd like to do now is discuss classical organizational theorists, including Taylor, Fayot, Weber, and Gulick. Frederick Taylor is well known for his development of the concept of scientific management. Taylor believed that increasing efficiency will occur when managers direct how work is done. In other words, the one best way to do a job is based on efficiency studies. There are several assumptions about scientific management and its effects. Increasing productivity makes work for more men rather than reducing the number of jobs. Increasing individual output increases wealth both in terms of products and income and shorter hours for workers. Scientific management remedies soldiering on or just putting in your time. Scientific management is a mental revolution for workers and employers. This slide summarizes the principles of scientific management. Activities based on scientific management include collection of data that result in tasks and standard competencies, ensuring a good fit between the worker and the job, performance assessment, including rewards and sanctions, and increasing the efficiencies of hierarchies and bureaucracies. If you consider these elements of Taylorism, you'll recognize that they are alive and well in the educational reform movement today. Henry Fayol defined elements that he believed were necessary to organize and manage a major organization or corporation. His primary interest and emphasis was managerial, which operates on personnel through principles, laws, and rules. However, many of his views are very pro-worker. Fayol was well known for his general principles of management. His idea of the division of work focuses on specialization, which produces more and better work with the same effort. Each change in work requires adaptation and reduces efficiency. Fayol's second principle focuses on authority and responsibility. A manager's official authority comes from the office and from personal authority. Responsibility is related to encouraging useful actions and discouraging their opposites through the use of rewards and sanctions. The complexity of work increases as management level increases. He observes that as the number of workers supervised increases, the levels of management also increase, contributing to their becoming remote, thus establishing responsibility and acting authoritatively is more difficult. Third, discipline. He defines discipline 
as obedience in accordance with the psychological contract between employer and worker. He believes that discipline is essential to the smooth running of a business, that it depends on the leader and the clarity of his commands, as well as experience in judiciously applying sanctions, including warnings, suspensions, and demotions. Four, unity of command. He argues that an employee should receive orders from only one supervisor. He believes that violation of this principle undermines authority, jeopardizes discipline, and threatens stability. Dual command brings hesitation, dissatisfaction, and disorder, and is a perpetual source of conflict. Five, unity and direction. Unity of command requires unity of direction. One person plans, directs, and coordinates work for the group to ensure they work towards the same objective. Six, subordination of individual to general interest. The interest of the group, the corporation, must prevail over the interest and needs of the workers and requires firmness of superiors, fair and clear agreements, and constant supervision. Seven, remuneration of personnel. Pay should be fair and mutually satisfying. The rate will depend on factors outside of the corporation and individual con control, including the cost of living, economic conditions, and the availability of workers. The value of the employee in terms of knowledge and skills, and fair pay for a fair day's work. Eight, centralization and decentralization. He believes that finding the optimum degree of each in an organization depends on the nature of work and the best use of all managerial and worker abilities. Scalar chain. The chain of authority from top down for all communication is essential to the success of business, but may be modified as needed to ensure efficiency. 10. Order. Materials must be organized and placed close to work and space must enable the person to render the most service. 11. Equity. Workers must be treated kindly and with justice for them to carry out their duties with devotion and loyalty. 12. Stability of tenure and personnel. Time is required for workers to learn their jobs and succeed. Stability of mediocre managers is preferable to an outstanding one that may come and go. 13. Initiative. Thinking out a plan and ensuring it, its success is the most powerful stimulant to human endeavor at all levels. The manager who permits the exercise of authority by subordinates is superior to those who cannot do so. Think about the 21st century skills in terms of vision, planning, and worker involvement. 14. Esprit de corps. Harmony and union among personnel is a great strength to the organization. It requires talent to coordinate a group, use their talents, encourage keenness, and reward each person's contribution without jealousy. It also requires that verbal contacts are timely, clear, and harmonious, and are greatly preferred over written communication. The work of Max Weber focused on the characteristics of bureaucratic organizations including the division of labor, impersonal orientation, the hierarchy of authority, rules and regulations, organizational goals, and leadership as management. I'll discuss each briefly by reviewing the concept and then identifying problems that may arise from implementation. First, division of labor. Individuals perform their activities in a fixed way as official duties. Because organizations are complex, a division of labor requires specialization to improve efficiency and expert knowledge to perform official duties. These can be specified as technical qualifications for jobs. Here's the problem. Although division of labor may enhance efficiency, it may also create boredom, which in turn reduces productivity. An antidote to boredom may be to enlarge and diversify employee responsibility. Two, impersonal orientation. Decisions must be made on the basis of facts, not feelings. 
In ensuring equality of treatment, managers reflect the rationality of organizations. Here's the problem. Although impersonality may improve decision making, it may also result in alienation, discontent, low morale, and low efficiency. Three, hierarchy of authority. Offices are arranged hierarchically. Lower ones are supervised by higher ones. According to Weber, the organizational chart is an artifact of this principle. This type of organizational structure is also designed to gain workers' compliance to supervisor directives. Here's the problem. Although a hierarchy of authority enhances vertical coordination, it can also lead to reducing communication. Information flowing from one level to another may be blocked or distorted as employees are reluctant to communicate bad information up to higher levels that may jeopardize their jobs. Hence, they communicate things they think their supervisors want to hear. This is an organizational chart of the hierarchical structure of education in the United States. Rules and regulations are established to define the duties of each position. They help to coordinate routine activities uniformly and provide continuity of operations when personnel are changed. Problems may arise when rules create rigidity or red tape that slows adaptation to change and rules can also lead to goal displacement, where rules and regulations intended to achieve goals become ends in themselves. Rules and regulations are also seen as substitutes for leadership. Clear rules, regulations, policies, and goals reduce the need for continuous supervision, and managers step in only when there may be an exception. Five, organizational goals. According to Amitai Etzioni, real goals are those towards which a majority of the organization's human and material resources are committed. Stated goals, on the other hand, are those that command few resources. Let's see how this principle is applied. If you want to know what is valued in an organization, look at where money is spent and not spent. In other words, follow the money. Six, leadership and management. Leaders or managers in hierarchical bureaucratic organizations view workers as passive, lazy, possess little ambition, prefer to be led, and resist change. Consequently, managers are compelled to use directive supervision styles and treat workers like children. Douglas McGregor described this tendency as theory X. Theory X relies on external control of people, emphasizes coercion, tight controls, uses threats and punishment to make workers comply. This creates a self-fulfilling prophecy in that when managers treat workers like children, they act that way. It's called trained incompetence. Here's the problem. When workers are treated as infants, it contributes to low morale, low productivity, alienation, antagonism, militant unions, and subtle sabotage. Weber also talks about positions of officials. According to Weber, office holding requires prescribed training and examinations. Those who accept a position obligate themselves to faithful management in return for a secure position. They are also loyal to impersonal and functional purposes of the organization. He also talks about perks of the position. Social esteem also comes with holding the office. Individuals enjoy a measure of independence, are compensated by fixed salary rather than wages, and may benefit from the opportunity for hierarchical promotion. The work of Gulick and Erwick is central to our discussion of classical organizational theory. They are best known for developing the organizational chart which depicts how work is divided into units and how they are structured to coordinate work. Here is a typical corporate organizational chart. If space permitted, I would have included unit supervisors, foremen, and team leaders below the division heads. Gulick and Erwick also discuss three important principles of organizational theory. First, they discuss the division of work. 
they recognized that worker skills and aptitudes varied considerably, which may influence how organizations are structured. They also raised questions as to whether the division of labor actually works in time and space, and wondered about its feasibility. They believe that even though conditions change, the division of work must not endanger the central design, and thus organizations are required to conduct planning and coordination. They also posited that work is coordinated through a structure of authority and singleness of purpose, as well as through specialists in a single directing authority, in other words, a boss. They argued that a span of control is needed to limit immediate managerial contacts in terms of numbers of people, locations, and diversification. They believed that effective coordination required technical efficiency of workers who are placed under technically competent supervisors. Structuring organizations must be approached from the top and bottom as well as reconciling the two at the center which defines the function of middle management. Gulick and Erwick described the work of executives using the now famous acronym PODSCAR, which includes planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. There are two types of communication patterns that have been identified in organizations, vertical and lateral. Vertical coordination is the most common way managers link people in organizational units. This is accomplished by creating a position of authority over other positions. Managers in hierarchical organizations create chains of command to coordinate and integrate activities and accomplish goals. They control activity by centralizing decision making, resolving conflict, solving problems, and evaluating performance and output as well as distributing rewards and sanctions. As I mentioned previously, problems arise when subordinates communicate information up through several layers of bureaucracy. They tend to report good news, in other words, what their supervisors expect to hear rather than, rather than what is actually happening. Executives often don't know what the problem is and consequently make poor decisions. Japanese corporations reduced the size of middle management that increased the quality and speed of information reaching executives and then down to workers that improve production. Lateral communication patterns are used when vertical processes are not adequate and are often used in complex task environments when uncertainty is high and change is rapid. Formal and informal meetings, task forces and coordinating committees whose membership includes specialists from several areas, may meet to work on a specific project or problem. Project coordinators work through persuasion, consultation, and negotiation, rather than through formal authority, roles, and policies. Matrix structures may include longer-term personal assignments, and when a task is complete, individuals return to their home departments. Problems may arise when individuals have two bosses and are thus out of the loop. They often get little credit for task force work in their own organizational unit. We need to pay particular attention to management as leadership in the structural frame. According to Rost, the role of excellent managers is to make it all work. When they do, they can have a powerful and enduring effect on organizations. The most important role of managers is to structure organizations by arranging roles, creating rules, regulations, and policy, and develop appropriate structures and relationships among units to accomplish work. They create a division of labor, who does what, and define relationships through vertical and horizontal integration. In other words, who reports to who. Excellent managers also view organizations as a unified whole which requires a systems perspective. And they also accomplish work through specialization and vertical integration. As Heifetz observes, excellent managers are on the balcony watching the dance as well as being part of the dance. Let's talk briefly about the characteristics of effective structural leaders. 
First, they find the right organizational design for the times and are able to get it implemented. They do their homework by studying structural problems, creating excellent internal information systems, analyzing and using data to make decisions. Second, they develop and modify rules, regulations, and policies that govern how routine work is done. Third, they make decisions on exceptions to the rules as well as monitor and adjust operations. Fourth, they rethink the relationship between structure, strategy, and environment. They understand how external environments can influence the internal structure of organizations and develop strategies for improving the quality of products. In schools, production may be viewed as enhancing the capacity of all children to learn at high levels. Fifth, Structural leaders focus on implementation. They understand that they will meet resistance to implementing structural changes, so they invest in training and retraining and build political bases for acceptance of new ideas. Lastly, they experiment, evaluate, and adapt. The only constant factor in organizations is change. Thus, excellent managers are constantly monitoring operations to identify ways to improve organizational performance using both formative and summative assessments. Let's briefly pose some questions and tasks related to using classical organizational theory. First, let's review. What are some of the key concepts that are found in classical organizational theory? Can you talk about Taylor? in terms of efficiency, time, and motion studies? Do you have a good knowledge of Weber's work in terms of division of labor, bureaucracy, hierarchy, and organizational goals, rules, regulations, and policies? Can you talk about Gulick and Erwick and their ideas on span of control in organizational charts? Next, let's apply what you know. Describe the characteristics of your organization using Taylor's, Weber's, and Gulick and Erwick's concepts. How is leadership described by classical organizational theorists? Most importantly, let's apply what we know to problem solving. We all recognize that organizations need structure. However, we also know that highly educated, creative individuals are alienated by close supervision and directive management. As an organizational leader, how can you retain the benefits derived from structure and minimize alienation? I hope this review was helpful and that you use key concepts to better understand organizations and management.